Okay, so we're going to talk a bit more about the protists and the uh, chlorophytes here with this fourth part. Uh, remember, we we're talking about chlorophytes, what makes them unique, and we talked about single-celled chlorophytes, kind of emphasizing this whole cladomonas and how it works. Um, now here's an example of a colonial chlorophyte. So colonial chlorophytes are evolutionary bridges to multicellular organisms. So colonial means you all group together, you all, everybody's kind of hanging out, but you're still independent. Bacteria are colonial organisms. They aggregate together, but they still act independently. Uh, Volvox here is an example of a colonial chlorophyte. So again, think about evolutionary connections towards multicellular land plants. Not the ancestor, but a cousin that's doing something similar to what the land plants are doing. Okay, so the way this works, the colonial chlorophytes, these guys are examples, oh, should capital that, examples of cellular specialization. So it's interesting that within Volvox, different cells take on different roles here. You have the daughter cells, you have the structural cells, but they still are not considered a multicellular organism. So this kind of soccer ball looking thing here, the circle or this one here, these are thousands of Volvox cells all aggregated together the outer cells form a protective, kind of a protective bag, and then the cells on the inside start undergoing meiosis to produce new daughter cells. Well, as they make new daughter cells, they grow, they grow, they grow, and then eventually the protective cells break apart, kind of like a membrane busting, and all these daughter colonies go floating out to colonize new areas. So, like I said, an interesting, interesting uh, feature when we look at the colonial chlorophytes. So that specialization is kind of moving them closer and closer to multicellular structures. All right, an important feature to mention about the colonial guys here is that they were kind of moving towards multicellular. Well, the multicellular ones work through this thing called a haplodiplantic life cycle. So big weird word, but let's chop it in half. Haplo, haploid. Diplo, diploid. So haploid, N, half the genetic material, diploid, 2N, full genetic material. To put that into context within an animal, haploid is your egg or sperm, diploid is you, the individual. So when these guys go through this life cycle, they're kind of bouncing back and forth based on how they're trying to reproduce. I'll show you a diagram in a minute here, but let's get some concepts on, on the page here. So we're going to start with the multicellular diploid organism. Let's call it the sporophyte. So the sporophyte will use meiosis, that cellular division process of meiosis, to produce spores. So the cells undergoing it will be the mother that the mother cells that undergo meiosis. Again, the animal parallel, ovary or testes undergo mother undergo meiosis to produce four haploid cells or haploid spores. And 
and these will have unique genetic combinations. Now, the gametophyte can be haploid and it can actually be multicellular. So that's where the weirdness comes into the picture. You know, we understand a multicellular diploid. That's like a cat, a dog, a person, etc., running around. You're a diploid, you got a bunch of cells. Our sperm are gametophytes. They're single celled. The egg is single celled because it's got half the genetic material. But in the case of these chlorophytes, they can actually have a multicellular haploid stage where every single cell only carries half the genetic material. Again, that's the weirdness. Oh, back up here with Claydomonas, they're haploid, but they're only a single cell until they become diploid. Some of these guys, they can be multicellular and still be haploid. So again, it's kind of a goofy thing. So if you are the multicellular haploid structure, we're going to call you a gametophyte, you're going to use mitosis to produce spores. So instead of meiosis, you're using the mitosis process. So the negative here, oh, sorry about that. Let me move the picture. Oh. The negative here is that all of your spores are genetically identical because you're just making copies and copies and copies and copies and copies. So you're now creating genetically identical clones of yourself. The gametes, though, can fuse together and form a diploid zygote. So you can take two of these gametes, bring them together, now they're diploid, they're 2N, and they're a zygote, which can then develop into the multicellular diploid stage. Okay, so here's the picture. So this is ova, it's a type of colonial, or a type of multicellular chlorophyte that goes through this haplodiplontic life cycle. Haploid, diploid. Haploid being 1N, diploid being 2N. So here's the gametophyte. It's multicellular. It's just half the genetic material. This is the positive strain. It's going to shoot out a bunch of little gametes, or we call them gametangia, that are all positives. Here's the negative one. It's going to shoot out a bunch of gametangia that are negative. Those two can fertilize and create the zygote. The zygote is 2N. The zygote now can germinate and grow and develop into a sporophyte, which is 2N, multicellular. Through meiosis, it's going to produce a bunch of spores here. And the spores will then grow and develop into these multicellular gametophytes. So again, a weird kind of goofy way of reproducing, but obviously it's worked evolutionarily. Some of these things have been around for hundreds of millions of years, and they're still there. They're still doing their thing. So as I just kind of a weird, goofy way of reproduction. So, okay. So that takes care of the chlorophytes. Now we want to take a quick look at the cherophytes. So this is another type of green algae. Cherophytes fall under the green algae. These guys are the closest relative to the land plants. By and large, these guys are freshwater algae. Okay, so these are relatives. If we go to a lake or a pond, odds are you're going to find some cherophytes in it. 
Okay, they're abundant, very common. There's all their algaes. There's lots of single cell. There's diatoms, etc. But cherophytes are fairly well represented. It, you can find them in the Midwest when we go look at algae within aquatic ecosystems. A big feature of these guys that make that connection to the land plants, so they're the closest relative, but a big feature that connects them to the land plants is this structure known as a plasmodesmata. The plasmodesmata is a connecting tube between two plant slash algae cells. So we see plasmodesmatas in plants. That's a unique plant feature or a feature found in the plants. But we also see it in the cherophytes, that structural adaptation. So what we will have is multicellular structures. Here's a cell and then another cell plant cell connected to it and imagine a little tube like this that links the two cells together you got another one here going down to another plant cell it bridges a connection between two plant cells allowing rapid exchange of nutrients and ions and things like that from one cell to the next and next. Again, that's found in plants. The parallel in animals are things called gap junctions, but this is a pretty rare feature. We find them in plants, but we also find them in these cherophytes, which is why they are the relative to the land plants. So, okay. All right, so let's wrap this up. Review slide, archaeoplastid. What is the big feature to put you into this particular group? Once you're here, so to get in here, to get in the club, you have to have this feature. Now, to go to rhodophyta, what do you have to have? What's your feature under the rhodophyta that says this makes us special? Let me give you a green star rhodophyta. Should be red, but I have green right now. All right, then let's go the other direction. Let's go green algae. What do you need to be in the green algae? What's your characteristic? What's your trait? What makes you different than rhodophyta? And once you're in green algae, what puts you in chlorophyta versus cherophyta? Pause on the land plants. I'm going to put pause here because we will pick up land plants when we go to kingdom plantae. There's a whole bunch of stuff to talk about within the plant world, so we're gonna pause those guys. But what, what characteristic puts you in cherophyta versus chlorophyta? What are the big features? Again, if you can't pull this out of your head right now, don't stress, but go back and review it. That's why I'm embedding these review slides. Review this again and again and again. Mix them up, print them off, Write them out, put them on note cards, whatever is a good technique for you as a learner. But these are going to be important slides to use for review. Okay. So, all right. So that is where I want to pause the second part. Again, I'm trying to reduce file size and I know this is a big, big chapter. So let me chop this off right here and we will cut this and then go to the third part to hopefully wrap up everything there because like I said these files are I don't want these files to be gigantic um, I'd rather cut it and make them smaller file sizes so go to the next expertise PowerPoint for the rest of the lecture I will put that down here okay so go to the next expertise PowerPoint for the rest of the lecture and we'll get into the last two supergroups, we have Rosaria and then Obstacantata, kind of a goofy, weird group, um, but not a whole lot we're going to cover under Protease. We're going to cover most of that under animals and fungi. All right, so go to the next.
set asides and let's tackle the rest of the protists.